Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Semmel Grand Rounds. Today, we have Dr. Stephen Martyr, who will be providing some practical clinical guidance on managing medical problems associated with antipsychotics. You can use the Q&A button to submit your questions for Dr. Martyr anytime. Um, and just remember to check your email after the presentation ends to fill out the survey for CME credit. Uh, as a final note, we will not be having Grand Rounds next week due to the Labor Day holiday, but we'll resume again on September 15th. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Yvonne Yang to introduce the morning speaker. Good morning, everyone. Um, it gives me such great pleasure to introduce our UCLA Grand Rounds speaker today, Dr. Stephen Martyr. So um, Steve is currently our Departmental Vice Chair of Education, a Professor in Residence and the Daniel X. Friedman Professor of Psychiatry, Director of the Section on Psychosis here at UCLA, and also the Director of the VA Myrec Research Center at the West Los Angeles VA. And I myself met Steve 10 years ago when I came to UCLA for residency, and it's my honor to call him my mentor and my friend. So Dr. Martyr, as many of you know, has been a leading figure in the field of psychiatry for nearly three decades. He has received numerous awards, both for excellence as a clinician and also for his research in schizophrenia. His work includes 300 peer-reviewed journal articles centering on the treatment of psychosis, and his current work continues to explore novel therapies, uh, most recently with oxytocin and ashwagandha. But um, importantly and relevant to his talk today, he's also played a major role in bringing agents to the market that can reduce the side effect burdens of the medications we use to treat the symptoms of schizophrenia. So Steve's talk today will focus on one of those areas, health issues for people on antipsychotics with a focus on diabetes and other aspects of metabolic syndrome. And of course, as many in the audience have experienced, weight gain and diabetes, of course, continue to be a major issue for patients and therefore for prescribers of antipsychotics. In the late 1990s and 2000s, Dr. Martyr convened a group of psychiatrists and other physicians to publish the first set of consensus guidelines for monitoring and treatment of metabolic syndrome associated with second generation antipsychotic medications. These consensus guidelines form the foundation of other guidelines published by other organizations, including the American Diabetes Association and the American Psychiatric Association. So Steve's talk today stems from those early observations and early work, and then his ongoing and continuing work with antipsychotics in patients with psychosis. But it also stems from something that's not read directly from Steve's CV, which is um, instead experienced daily by his patients, his trainees, his colleagues, his mentees, and his friends, which is his deep humanism. Dr. Martyr's work is driven by something incredibly valuable and sometimes not really discussed in our field, which is simply caring deeply for his patients. And I reflect often on how incredibly lucky we are to have somebody, um, to have Steve here in our midst, who's a leader in our field, nationally and internationally known, but is really driven by compassion and kindness for his patients, trainees, and mentees. His talk today reflects those values as, they fo as the talk focuses on improving the patient experience of having chronic psychosis and taking antipsychotic medications. Please join me in welcoming Steve Martyr. Yvonne, thanks so much for that very nice introduction. Uh, today for this talk, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, the talk is pre-recorded. By pre-recording the talk, uh, I believe you'll see that we're able to make the talk more engaging and uh, easier to follow. It doesn't necessarily make me into a spellbinding speaker, but I think you'll find that it will uh, make it easier to sort of pay attention and to um, it'll synchronize what I'm saying with the uh, actual graphics. So with that, let me uh, start the tape and then we'll come back live afterwards for the Q&A. The talk today will be a practical clinical update on uh, health issues, particularly weight gain and diabetes that are associated with uh, antipsychotics. I'm going to talk mostly about schizophrenia because that's the illness where I have the most credibility. Um, and I'm also going to describe an approach to psychiatric disorders, and I'm talking about serious mental illnesses, that really integrates a concern about physical health along with mental health. And I think you'll see those linkages throughout this talk. Here are my disclosures. 
I think a couple of them are highly relevant. I will be talking about different medications and antipsychotics. So my consultations to industry are worth noting. And I'm going to uh, present some slides from up to date, which uh, I'm the um, editor for, uh, for psychosis for up to date. And I will actually present some slides from up to date. I don't believe you're going to see any of the presentations though as being influenced by any of these relationships. So let me start and go back to when I first became aware of this problem. Uh, from 1977 until the mid 1990s, I ran a, uh, I co-ran a psychiatry ward in this building, building 210. It was a 30 bed ward, which was considered a schizophrenia research unit. And I worked with this man, my uh, close friend and collaborator, uh, and, and now unfortunately the late Ted Van Putten. The, we were probably among the first clinicians in the area to uh, treat patients with clozapine. And during the 1990s, uh, there was the introduction of a number of new medications. And it was a very exciting time to be a schizophrenia researcher with an interest in medications. But Ted and I noticed things happening. We had patients on clozapine gain vast amounts of weight. When new antipsychotics, and we did phase two trials for risperidone and olanzapine and uh, aripiprazole and, and quetiapin. And as we did those studies, we at first were impressed by how well tolerated the medications were. I remember talking to Ted about how olanzapine must be the ideal antipsychotic because patients actually liked it, something we had never seen before with an antipsychotic. But then uh, Donna Ames in this picture uh, came and began to work with us. She was a very perceptive young psychiatrist who began realizing that patients were gaining weight. And we saw other things. For example, I could remember very clearly in the 210 basement, Donna telling me about a patient who was on risperidone and who had developed a uh, diabetic ketoacidosis with astronomical glucose levels. Uh, we had never seen this before, and that individual had no history of diabetes. Donna went on uh, to look at this more carefully, and she did this uh, with her uh, ex-husband, uh, Bill Wershing, also a very astute clinician. They, uh, in 1998, they were among the first to describe six cases of new onset diabetes, four were from patients on, were on patients on clozapine, two were for patients on olanzapine. She also observed weight gain in 1999. She published one of the first studies of uh, showing that uh, clozapine, olanzapine, and risperidone were all associated with weight gain. Clozapine for clozapine and olanzapine, the changes were the most substantial, but we were also seeing it with risperidone. And this alerted to us to the fact that we had a problem. And the problem, as we learned more about it, was even more substantial. Uh, what I'm going to do is to get into these issues in depth, to talk about uh, premature mortality in schizophrenia, how this weight gain and development of diabetes were a serious problem. Was this just an issue with the illness itself or was it from drugs? I'm gonna talk about antipsychotics and I'm going to go more deeply into how appetite and feeding behavior is regulated and the role of antipsychotics. And then I'm going to be very practical. I'm going at the end to talk just very briefly uh, since I'm talking about health and schizophrenia it's hard to avoid giving at least a little bit of time to COVID-19 and schizophrenia. Uh, 
So first I wanted to go into premature mortality in schizophrenia. So this is from a couple of studies which looked at premature mortality. Uh, one is over a 30 year period in Scandinavia. Another is a study using uh, Medicaid databases uh, within the United States. What's important is that there's a uh, substantial evidence that people with schizophrenia have a life expectancy that on average is 20 to 25 years briefer than the general population. And that's a point that needs to be underlined. That's uh, a terrible health outcome. Uh, these people, when they die, they're not dying of strange things, although there's a high suicide rate and other things. This mortality is related mostly to cardiovascular disease. They're mostly dying from heart disease, uh, which is the most common uh, source of early death. Uh, and there are, of course, a number of explanations. There are high rates of smoking within this population, uh, which adds to cardiovascular disease. These people may be uh, physically less active. Obesity rates are high. They have high, uh, they tend to be, have diabetes and pre-diabetes. They have untreated hypertension. And there are health disparities that affect many patients with uh, schizophrenia, particularly people of color, where they, uh, have inadequate uh, access to uh, health care. Moving on to the next slide, it raises the question whether schizophrenia itself is associated with elevated cardiovascular risk. Is this a risk factor? And it's a similar question that you could ask for bipolar illness, where there is a history suggest it's associated with elevated cardiovascular risk. One can go back to look at evidence of uh, diabetes risk. And again, diabetes, uh, the risk of diabetes, diabetes mellitus, particularly adult onset diabetes, is highly associated with uh, risk for heart disease. This is from a study that goes back to 1945, uh, which showed that uh, people with schizophrenia uh, had a delayed action of insulin that they seemed to have. Uh, this was before the era of antipsychotics, um, a, a type of insulin resistance. It's interesting, the first author of the article, uh, Captain Braceland, is Francis Braceland, who went on during the 1960s and early 19s, and through most of the 1970s as the uh, editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry. I pulled this out of the um, archives from the American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, but there's even stronger evidence and that's more recent. This is from a study in 2003, which measured, uh, which looked at uh, normal weight people who uh, were in the first episode, they had not had antipsychotic, and they measured their fasting glucose, insulin, and lipids and the people with schizophrenia had uh, significantly higher fasting plasma gl glucose levels, uh, and they had higher insulin levels. So this points to the fact that people with schizophrenia were more insulin resistant, and this was measured using a homo homeostasis model assessment, a HOMA assessment. So this sort of established that people with schizophrenia are at an excess risk of being at least pre-diabetic because of insulin resistance. Uh, this is from a large cohort study from uh, Denmark, which looked at uh, drug-naive young people with schizophrenia. These individuals were three times more likely than the normal population to develop diabetes. In other words, they had a hazard ratio of 3.0. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, people with diet, type two diabetes and schizophrenia share a number of susceptibility genes. So there does seem to be a linkage suggesting that schizophrenia and type two diabetes are likely to occur together. Um, 
which actually suggests that there's a, uh, a sort of double risk because the risk of developing diabetes increases three to six fold when patients are treated with an antipsychotic. So you can see that antipsychotic treated people with diabetes are at an extraordinarily high risk for um, developing diabetes. So moving on to antipsychotics and weight gain and diabetes, what's the association there? Well, this is from a study that uh, shows that antipsychotics can have direct effects on uh, insulin resistance. This is a study from uh, Norway from uh, 2019. Uh, what's important to note is that, you know, one of the common causes of diabetes is weight gain and obesity, but those need to be separated in that uh, antipsychotics themselves can increase insulin resistance without affecting weight at all. They found in both healthy controls and seriously mentally ill patients, the effects on insulin resistance were related to leptin, which is uh, a peptide that uh, sort of reduces eating behavior. And adiponectin is uh, secreted by adipose tissue and it uh, sort of promotes eating. So, so the relationship between the two was associated with insulin resist resistance. This is clinically important because it suggests that if a clinician is going to protect their patient from the effects of obesity and diabetes, that uh, just looking at uh, weight, belt size, is not sufficient, that they need to look at measures of insulin resistance. Again, it's important for clinicians to look closely at insulin resistance, even in patients who don't gain weight. This next study uh, addresses the question of whether or not these drugs have actually led to deaths. Have the introduction of newer antipsychotics in the late 90s and the early 2000s, were they associated with increased death rates due to diabetes and such? Well, actually, using this large population study from Finland, 5.2 million people, uh, they found that life expectancy did not decline as more people were treated with uh, second generation antipsychotics or SGAs. Moreover, the drug which has one of the wor worst metabolic profiles, clozapine, was associated with the lowest mortality. And quetiapin, a drug which has a very bad metabolic profile, actually had the highest mortality. Um, moreover, the longer a patient was on an antipsychotic, the lower their mortality. So this, although this is a problem we need to address, it's probably not increasing mortality rate uh, for, for most patients. Um, I wanna focus a, mi a minute on a population which I think is particularly vulnerable to these effects, and that is young people. This is a study of eight to 19 year old people with schizophrenia, most of them in their mid-teens, who were randomly assigned to uh, Melinda on a drug which is probably inaccessible now, olanzapine or risperidone. And I'm not gonna talk about whether they worked or not. Each of these drugs worked about the same. But I wanna point out that within an eight week trial, there were huge differences. If you start with molindone, you could see that during the eight week trial, more people lost weight than gained weight. Each of those red bars is an individual patient. If you look at the next uh, figure, it's for olanzapine, and you'll see that here the majority of patients gained weight. And if you look at the BMI percentile change, you could see that a substantial proportion gained more than 20% of their weight in eight weeks. So these drugs cause rapid weight gain. 
Uh, risperidone is slightly better, but not all that great. This next slide shows you metabolic changes on the three drugs. First, you'll see that olanzapine causes a small increase in cholesterol. I want to draw your attention to insulin. And what you see is that during the just eight weeks, uh, olanzapine led to just a 100% increase in insulin levels. What this points to is the fact that these patients during a brief period of time were becoming insulin resistant. Um, and without a lab test, many of these clinicians would not have noticed that. Uh, this is an interesting study because it was stopped prematurely because the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board said that uh, olanzapine was unsafe uh, in young people. And it led to a recommendation, and this is from the Schizophrenia Patient Outcome Research Team, uh, that met in uh, 2010, and I was actually part of that consensus meeting, we recommended that uh, neither clozapine nor olanzapine should be considered a first-line treatment for people with schizophrenia because of these robust effects on uh, both weight gain and the risk of uh, diabetes. Now, this is uh, from up-to-date. Uh, and uh, what you could see, it shows you that uh, if you look at the column of weight gain and diabetes, you could see there are very large differences among drugs. And I think this is what most clinicians probably use as sort of a reliable indicator that they can make clinical decisions based on the metabolic risk of drugs. The, uh, it appears from this, that the risk of weight gain and diabetes is the same in these drugs, although there are slight differences. For example, uh, I've looked at most trials and quetiapin uh, doesn't seem to cause the robust weight gain of the other drug of uh, say olanzapine, but it's also associated with substantial uh, increases in uh, insulin resistance. Uh, so, you know, you know there, there may be slight differences among drugs. So now I want to go on to this very interesting uh, area of uh, how do we understand these changes and why do people gain weight and why do they become uh, insulin resistant uh, and how is this exacerbated by antipsychotics? So let's look more closely at what happens to somebody who starts on an antipsychotic, particularly a drug like uh, clozapine and olanzapine. Uh, they usually gain weight rapidly during the first six to eight weeks. The weight gain kind of continues, although the w rate of weight gain uh, seems to decrease and sometimes plateaus. So it's rapid early weight gain. Uh, for drugs like clozapine, olanzapine, and risperidone, there's evidence that it's actually dose-related. So uh, putting people, many patients, for example, are discharged from uh, inpatient units on 30 or 40 milligrams of olanzapine. Uh, and it may feel safe, but actually it has a very serious uh, effects on their metabolic risk, on their cardiovascular risk. Um, studies that actually interviewed patients uh, showed that these individuals reported two things. One, an increase in appetite and a delay in satiety signaling. This is important to note, and I think it has clinical meaningfulness. For example, if you're starting someone on olanzapine because it just seems to be the right drug or clozapine, I think what a clinician should do is warn them. This drug may increase your appetite and you may find that uh, stopping eating is altered, that you may not have that uh, feeling of fullness that uh, 
or satisfaction that you used to have. So you have to regulate how much you eat uh, differently. Uh, people have suggested, well, maybe this is because these people are, uh, they're not as vigorous, they're less active, but that does, that seems to be a relatively weak factor in looking at uh, weight gain. And there's also fMRI studies, which have found that uh, one week after starting on olanzapine, patients uh, showed uh, increasing anticipatory and consumatory uh, responses to food rewards. Uh, this was studies that, that looked at reward circuitry. So otherwise, could people just, they're hungry. The, uh, they find uh, food more satisfying and rewarding. And they found decreased activation in areas that inhibit feeding. So it, people are getting hungrier, uh, food is more rewarding, and they find uh, that it's hard to sort of to stop eating. So I'm going to give just a very brief uh, overview of how appetite is regulated in, in humans. Um, and, and again, this is uh, relatively um, uh, condensed, uh, but I, I think it gives a feeling that there are peptides that are secreted both from the GI tract uh, an adipose tissue, which uh, signal to the brain, particularly the arcuate nucleus of the hypo, hypothalamus, which then um, signals the brain about uh, appetite. So starting with uh, orexigenic peptides, which increase appetite, ghrelin uh, is secreted by the stomach and it affects, uh, it signals the hypothalamus to um, secrete orexins and neuropeptide Y and other peptides that actually increased appetite. On the other end, uh, uh, leptin from adipose tissue, other adiporectins, uh, CCK from the small intestine, factors from the stomach, and GL, uh, gluca glucagon-like peptide one, GLP-1, from the intestines provide a signal, uh, an orexigenic signal to the uh, hypothalamus, which uh, then uh, decreases eating and, and provides a signal of satiety. As you could see, appetite is elegantly regulated and antipsychotics can sort of change this, rec this regulation through a number of mechanisms. Um, it's important to note that there's no clear single mechanism. It appears to be a relatively complex interplay between uh, antipsychotics, which have multiple mechanisms and affect neural hormones and peptides in different ways, and appetite. Olanzapine and clozapine, for example, reduce uh, GLP-1 secretion, uh, and they actually, to this mechanism, modulate sweet taste sensitivity. Uh, so it, again, it gives a signal to the hypothalamus, which uh, increases eating. Uh, Antipsychotics increase leptin, which in the limited sense you would think so it's anorexigenic that it would sort of decrease appetite, but that's probably not a, that's probably an indirect effect that's secondary to weight gain, which uh, where people become more insensitive to leptin. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, antipsychotics can decrease insulin resistance by altering the leptin to adiponectin ratio, which uh, you know, you know, has a direct effect on, on insulin uh, effects. Uh, D2 blockade, which all antipsychotics seem to do, uh, themselves can increase food intake. Um, uh, some antipsychotics are uh, inverse agonists at 5-HT2C receptors. That seems to induce weight gain. And there's substantial evidence that another mechanism uh, regulating weight is uh, H1 antagonism, which uh, acts as, a, as an appetite stimulant. 
Um, so now for some, how does this translate into clinical care? This is the more practical part of this talk. Well, as I began to uh, see these problems, I began talking to a number of my colleagues about how clinicians should address this. I mean, as I look back on these patients who had uh, diabetic, uh, who developed diabetes and gained huge amounts of weight, could we have seen it earlier? What should we have done of clinicians? And I actually assembled and shared a meeting that was held at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, which brought together psychiatrists and, um, and, and a number of medical specialists in areas like uh, endocrinology, diabetes, and uh, health to kind of reach a consensus about what psychiatrists should actually monitor to uh, safely administer antipsychotic drugs. And again, I'm talking about schizophrenia, but I think that many of these things should relate also to uh, uh, treating bipolar illness with uh, antipsychotics. Uh, we developed guidelines uh, which have been updated and regulated. This is integrates all of these guidelines from up to date, but you could see what we're recommended was that clinicians, when they treat someone with an antipsychotic, they should know whether there's a family history of diabetes or hypertension or heart disease. Uh, in general, it's a population that's already at high risk. We want to know how high it is. I'm not talking about decreasing smoking behavior, but that's a very reasonable uh, target of intervention. And most studies find that uh, a, high a substantial proportion of people with schizophrenia uh, will reduce smoking if they have proper interventions. I'm going to talk more about physical activity and diet later. Uh, clinicians should be aware of a patient's weight. Uh, they should, at our clinic, when we were live, we uh, weighed the patient at every visit. We measured their waist circumference since uh, waist circumference, you know, that, that central body fat is a high, is very much predictive of uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, we recommended doing that really at every visit. And now when we're, it's virtual, we oftentimes recommend that our patients get a bathroom scale, an inexpensive one if they can afford it. Uh, we recommend regular blood pressure checks, which could also be done at home for patients who can't come into the clinic. Now, I want to emphasize the next one, which is fasting glucose or, a, or hemoglobin A1C. Now, what you want to do is see early on at as early as six or eight weeks, whether a patient uh, is developing um, insulin resistance uh, and if their hemoglobin A1C or their fasted glucose are increasing. Um, this, uh, because these early uh, increases are very much predictive of what's going to happen later and that the clinicians should continue to uh, evaluate those at irregular intervals. And of course, uh, lipid profiles, triglycerides, which are also associated with uh, insulin resistance, can rise relatively early and should be measured periodically. I believe that this kind of monitoring strategy is what should be done. Many clinicians say, well, you know, the psychiatrist doesn't have time. Uh, or uh, it should be done by the primary care provider. My belief is that the psychiatrist is probably the one with the best understanding of these risk factors. And again, you don't have to have a, a scale in your office to regulate these things. You could have patients buy them, but I think we should inquire about these things and pick them up relatively early. And again, send patients uh, to the laboratory. Um, so here are some guidance, and for this I'm grateful to uh, Karen Gill, who, uh, who is a, an advanced practice mental health nurse who works with us in the psychosis clinic on, on Friday morning and does uh, 
and helps us uh, monitor these things. Uh, these are four interventions which uh, I think uh, should be part of antipsychotic treatment. First, if a patient gains weight on uh, a drug that's associated with a high risk of weight gain, changing the person to a drug with a lower risk works. That's been proven by a Cochrane review and, and it's sometimes the simplest intervention. Uh, looking early, uh, as I've said, uh, and then changing antipsychotics as quickly as possible when a person is particularly vulnerable is a good idea. Lifestyle interventions work. And I don't have time to talk about all of the different types, but I'll talk a moment about uh, characteristics of the right kind of intervention. But uh, in our clinic, and I think in many clinics, people are using metformin, particularly when patients show evidence of prediabetes or uh, insulin resistance. Uh, it decreases appetite and can promote uh, weight loss in many patients. And it's been shown in trials, as, a, as I'll show in a moment. So there are a number of characteristics of lifetime intervention, of lifestyle interventions, all of them will include both uh, nutritional counseling and, um, and, and physical activity. And in fact, at our uh, psychosis clinic, we've actually made contact with uh, nutrition clinics at UCLA, and we've sent some of our patients there. Uh, interventions should be longer, at least three months or more. Uh, if they're manualized and highly structured, they're more likely to work. They should focus on both nutrition and physical activity, including both educational and exercise-based sessions. Uh, they should have active monitoring, such as weigh-ins and food diaries, uh, rather than just education alone. Patients should be active participants in monitoring their, uh, what they're eating. Uh, and there should be active monitoring of physical activity and, and fitness levels, which now is you know, much more done by sort of wearable devices. Regarding drugs, as I mentioned, meta-analyses have identified metformin as the most effective adjunctive medication for antipsychotic associated weight gain. It, uh, metformin decreases the intestinal absorption of glucose. It increases insulin sensitivity it reduces hepatic glycogenesis, and it suppresses appetite. Not everyone likes it. It uh, sometimes makes patients feel a little bit queasy, and we don't want them losing weight because they feel lousy. But uh, for most of our patients, we found it to be effective. And it's most effective in younger first episode patients. And if you can, I'm sure all of you can imagine treat young people, the cost of weight gain in terms of self-esteem and such uh, can be devastating. So it's important to intervene early. Uh, we usually don't recommend topiramate. It's less studied. Uh, it can be somewhat effective, but it also leads to cognitive side effects and sometimes parathesias. So we're less likely to recommend it. Uh, there is an interest in uh, uh, liraglutide. Uh, it's a, uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, GLP-1 is an orexigenic uh, peptide, and this is an agonist for uh, GLP-1. Uh, it's administered subcutaneously, and it, it does contribute to weight loss. Uh, and, you know, research studies, uh, uh, clinical trials have shown that um, it reduced um, weight, it improved gluc, I shouldn't say reduced gluc, but it, it improved uh, glucose tolerance, uh, well, insulin tolerance, and uh, in patients who were taking clozapine or olanzapine. Um, and here's an, another introduction. Uh, there's a new drug which is likely to be approved by FDA. It's a combination of, um, of olanzapine with a mu opioid antagonist, samadorfan. Uh, so it would be a combination pill. Uh, this is from a uh, phase two study. 
And if you look uh, at the orange line of patients who are put on a uh, on just the lansipine alone, lansipine plus placebo, uh, you'll see uh, that, uh, and this is looking at uh, percent uh, weight gain, you'll see that there's this rapid weight gain that occurs within six weeks and tends to level off, but is still increasing. Uh, but if you look at the green line for um, Alanzapine plus Samadorfan, you could see that it uh, attenuates this weight gain. It doesn't stop it, but it uh, decreases it. And again, these patients were also given nutritional counseling to sort of maximize the effects. So I want to go to my uh, almost final section, which is exercise itself as an intervention. And to make the point that exercise uh, is a, uh, it's good for both physical health and brain health. And let me make that point with studies from two different uh, groups. This is the first from uh, a study by uh, Robert Kern, uh, someone who I closely collaborate with at both the uh, VA and here at UCLA. This is a study he did on aerobic exercise. Uh, and it looked at cardiovascular fitness. If you look at these figures, it's for 54 veterans who received either aerobic exercise or just a stretching exercise. And if you look at the control group at uh, baseline and uh, later on, and this is looking at cardiorespiratory fitness, there was no change. If you look at the uh, aerobic exercise group, they had statistically significant change. So it act, so again, it worked. But this looked at um, the Birchwood social functioning scale. And again, there was a very little change in the control group of stretching. But if you look at the people who had aerobic exercise, there was an, an increase. And you could see that it almost reached statistical significance. Uh, but it had an effect size of 0.35, which you know, is uh, not a trivial effect size. So again, it suggests that exercise does more than just um, help cardiovascular fitness. It seems to have larger effects. And now I want to introduce a study by uh, a group of our investigators, uh, Keith Nectarline, who heads the aftercare program, uh, Joseph Ventura, who's uh, a psychologist who, uh, works with Keith in the aftercare program, but also in our um, psychosis clinic, and uh, Sarah McEwen, a uh, young uh, uh, psychologist researcher. What they did is they uh, studied aerobic exercise when it was added to uh, uh, cognitive training. So remember, all these patients are getting cognitive training. The question is, would exercise um, add to those effects. Uh, and it was a rather intensive exercise. These aren't patients, so don't worry about uh, uh, HIPAA or confidentiality. But uh, pa patients had two days a week of uh, aerobic exercise and strength conditioning by a fitness instructor. Uh, they monitored heart weight and um, Patients were told to get to a heart rate zone. This was followed by uh, aerobic exercise at home as well. Uh, and they had homework. And the results, as you could see, this looks at uh, a change in overall uh, composite score on the matrix battery, which is a, uh, a battery that measures cognition and schizophrenia. And again, this is a composite uh, score. And you could see that when you added uh, exercise to uh, cognitive training, you got a um, you know, substantial improvement. And this is uh, an effect size of about 0.4, which again is uh, what I consider to be a clinically important effect size. Uh, this looked at role functioning. And again, you see that the group that received the cognitive training uh, exercise along with cognitive training uh, 
had greater improvement. And here the effect size is even better at uh, above 0.5. Um, this looked at cortical thickness, and this is a particular study done, done by Sarah McEwen. And if you look at p value, if you look, the patients who got uh, uh, both the cognitive training with exercise had a larger increase says in cortical thick thickness than the uh, group that just got uh, cognitive training. So again, and, and uh, I think they also looked that this might be supported by the fact that they had increases in BDNF, which promotes uh, uh, neural plasticity. In other words, uh, exercise is having direct effects on the brain as well as being good for weight loss and uh, overall physical health. Um, I'm not going to talk at great length about uh, COVID, but just to provide a couple of things which really can't be ignored in this area. One is so many of our patients are at increased risk for uh, dying if they developed COVID-19. Our patients, uh, because of obesity, diabetes, uh, other factors, uh, should be seen as a high-risk group. And yet sometimes it's hard to protect them because some, we're noticing in our clinics that some patients have trouble adhering to uh, spacing and other things. So I, I think we can look for other things. The other thing is that uh, infection with COVID-19 can actually cause neural inflammation and cause the onset of psychotic symptoms. And I've gotten at least a couple of calls where this has been the case. And in some cases, patients didn't recover rapidly. So uh, there are case reports also of patients with uh, schizophrenia whose symptoms got worse when they were affected by COVID-19, when they had a COVID-19 infection. So I think we should look for this. Um, Clozapine, uh, which you know is, is the most effective antipsychotic and has the worst side effects, uh, can slightly increase the risk of COVID-19 infections, probably because it reduces immunoglobulin levels. Uh, again, it's uh, the, the the decrease is small, but I think clinicians should be aware of it. And we've also heard that uh, COVID infections can increase the risk of clozapine. Um, intoxication. There have been a number of clinical reports. I just wanted to add that as we are concerned about the health needs of our patients. So I want to just summarize the main points I wanted to make. Again, I've tried to emphasize that in treating serious mental illnesses, we usually treat these things not for weeks, but for decades and most of the patient's life. We need to have an awareness about their physical health and their increased risk of cardiovascular disease, premature death, diabetes, and obesity. We give them drugs which have the potential to worsen this risk. And I didn't add, but I probably should have, that not all antipsychotics uh, increase this risk. Uh, if you had looked at the up-to-date list, some of them have negligible or no effects on weight. But for those who do, these effects appear to be most related to changes in appetite regulation. Uh, there are multiple approaches to addressing this. Uh, lifestyle changes work. Uh, and there are some medications, particularly metformin, that can attenuate this weight gain. And exercise, uh, I think all of us should promote exercise in our patients and physical activity. It's not just good for their uh, weight and their heart, it's uh, good for brain health. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. And now we're gonna go live for the uh, Q&A. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Steve, for a, a fantastic and really wide ranging talk. So clear. Um, we do have a few questions from audience members, so I thought I'd jump in to first some of the pharmacological agents that you talked about.
Um, there's a question from the audience regarding metformin, um, particularly for first break or younger clients, is it justifiable to start metformin right away when starting antipsychotics? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, what I would recommend is that if you start someone on an antipsychotic that's like that's likely to increase weight, like a lansipine or quetiapine or clozapine, uh, to monitor uh, that patient closely, to, to weigh them at every visit, and to uh, certainly, as, as I mentioned, to get a, uh, either a fasting blood glucose or, a, uh, or an A1C at, at six to eight weeks. And then if there's evidence of elevations, I would probably recommend starting them on metformin. There are studies that suggest that metformin is more effective in young first break people. And again, and, and I would also say that if anybody gains uh, like one BMI unit, you know, five, six pounds, I would uh, certainly consider it. You know, some people do respond well to nutritional counseling and they, if they begin to see it, it might not be necessary, but uh, again, I would agree in first break people, I would try to get uh, control of that. Also, I have to say that I wish I knew now what, I, I wish I knew back in the 1990s what I know now, because we saw this sort of get out of hand much too early, and I don't, I don't think we should let that happen. Thanks. On the topic of dietary regulation, um, from the same person in the audience, there's a question um, if there are any studies looking at low carb or ketogenic diets for people starting or taking antipsychotics to reduce the probability of weight gain right off the bat. Yeah, there are, you know, and what's interesting is that almost every study of a nutritional intervention has shown that it's a, uh, that it's effective, you know, Knowing what I, what I know about, about this uh, problem regulating appetite, I would think that one of the main things I would train people with on antipsychotics is portion control, to not rely on their, uh, this, the signals that usually guided their eating, that you know, people who've never had a weight problem are suddenly gaining weight because they, they were used to a satiety signal that stopped them. So maybe looking at portion control also as being very important. And you know, along those lines of the regulation of the appetite um, system, there's another question uh, asking if you know if there have been studies looking at naltrexone for antipsychotic induced weight gain. Yes, <laughs> there were, uh, and, and they were done by Syntec and the uh, Yale group and, and the results were a little disappointing. There, there were suggestions of a signal, but not very strong. I, I would have hoped it would have been stronger. Um, again, you know, the fact that something fails in a clinical trial doesn't mean that it's not worth studying again in different populations. So getting more at the um, origins of weight gain caused by antipsychotics, um, we have another question. Is olanzapine-related insulin resistance dose-related? Yes, yeah, the, it's been studied with clozapine and olanzapine, and, and it's clearly dose related with both. And, and reducing the dose is important. And, and, and this is a particular issue with olanzapine, which is very well tolerated. You know, it, uh, the, the side effects uh, that, that patients experience are relatively minor, and clinicians feel safe escalating the dose. Uh, and um, this, this is seen many times when patients are on an insulin, uh, are on an inpatient unit. They're treated with, uh, say, 30 or 40 milligrams of olanzapine a day during their inpatient stay. Uh, and, and the clinician feels like they're getting away with it, but then when they're discharged, this new problem emerges of uh, insulin resistance and weight gain. So speaking of transitioning to outpatient and sort of sustainable practices, how successful have you guys been in the psychosis clinic at convincing patients to exercise consistently and maintain, you know, sustainable dietary change? It's, you know, it's, 
it's highly variable, but uh, surprisingly successful. Uh, Yvonne, I think that there's a tendency to, um, to stigmatize people with schizophrenia by, uh, by suggesting that they're all disinterested and that they don't respond to these things. Many of our patients are actually, uh, they're vigorous exercisers. One of the problems with the um, pandemic is that these people would really use the gym and they would use exercise and, and all of a sudden they, they can't. I, I, I think it's been surprisingly successful. And as I said, it's most successful when it's monitored, you know, either by the patient or the clinician and where they get continuous feedback uh, about how they're doing. So we have a new question. Is dopaminergic regulation of insulin or glucagon release from pancreatic cells clinically relevant? Yes, uh, it, it, it probably is regulated. And, and again, it's, the, the, it, it's such a appetite regulation is so complex that, you know, I, I think glucagon regulation by pancreas could certainly uh, be adding to it. I'm not sure how antipsychotics affect that, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it's, it's certainly worth considering. Yeah. And maybe in our last few minutes, you could talk with us about how patients in your clinic are adapting to the pandemic and how, how it's been affecting them. Well, you know, I, I think it's important that there's no single answer to that because it affects patients so differently. For some people, it's, uh, it's a minimal change in, in their lives that uh, they've been isolated, unable to do many things. Uh, for some people who are suspicious that the world is dangerous, that they feel that those suspicions were kind of supported. But for many others, uh, it's been devastating. Uh, there are many patients who are with schizophrenia who are working, who are uh, really depend on the social relationships at jobs and school, or even in a, in a day program. And it's also had huge effects on families and caregivers who all of a sudden, you know, where patients were able to go to uh, activities during the day that they're unable to do it. So, I'm, I mean, I would say it's like highly variable and uh, one would need to sort of look at individuals. Also, as I mentioned, there are new cases of COVID related psychoses that are, are coming up. There was a, an interesting uh, case described in the New England Journal just two weeks ago about uh, an individual who had a COVID infection and had a, a brief psychosis. And I've been getting calls about some of these cases. So I think it's something new for clinicians to consider. I think one final question um, that has sometimes come up in, um, in our clinic is how, you, how do you balance the question of wanting to intervene with the most effective medications for young people, for instance, clozapine, but clozapine is also one of the most weight gaining and most diabetogenic um, agents that we have. Yeah, that's a question that's really, you know, re requires an in-depth conversation with the patient and, and sometimes family members. Uh, if the, just because clozapine, just because the patient's overweight doesn't mean that clozapine will increase their weight. Uh, you know, I tell patients, well, clozapine has no calories, uh, that uh, if it's <laughs> too late, it's going to be related to behaviors. And sometimes people with clozapine, they're, they're more engaged, they're more, uh, more likely to exercise, more likely to sort of uh, carefully consider uh, nutritional counseling. Uh, there, there's a long history that clozapine treated patients tend to respond to psychosocial interventions better. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a complex question that uh, should be discussed with patients. Thanks so much. Thank you.